morning and welcome to Solid Ground. In just a minute, Pastor Mike is going to be with us and share an amazing message about following Jesus through the story of Palm Sunday. But before he does, I want to say a special welcome to you. You know, it's always somebody's first Sunday, and maybe that's you this morning. And so we would just want to say welcome, and we want to know we want you to know that we care. And so the best way to share a prayer request or if you have a question, the best way to reach us is through our website at sgbic.com. In fact, our website is the best way to stay connected to all of the things that are happening around here. And we've got some exciting things that are coming up. In just a few weeks, we have Discover SG coming up. That's a place where new people can learn to know us and we can get to know you. So make sure you check that out. Then the week after that, we have a new members meeting and a taco lunch is coming to support our Mexico missions trip. You won't want to miss it. But again, the easiest way to find out all of those things and so much more is through our website at sgbic.com. Well, I was thinking this week, you know, I was thinking when I was younger, I really loved my youth group. It was a place where we could play, we could sing worship songs, but it was also a place where I could ask tough questions and grow in my walk with the Lord. And it made such a difference to me later in life. It changed the whole course of my life. And one of the things that I love about Solid Ground is seeing our youth grow and thrive. And so this morning, I wanna say a big thank you to you for all of your prayers and support for the many ministries that you make possible around here. Whether it's our youth group or SG Kids or the ministry at Alta Loma Christian School, or there's so many things that you make possible. And I wanna say a big thank you. So as we continue in worship this morning, let's pray over our tithes and offerings and just believe that God wants to do more through each and every one of us as we partner together. Let's pray. God, thank you for the things that you are doing right here through Solid Ground and in our community. God, thank you for the ways in which you are multiplying these gifts and talents for your kingdom purposes. God, I pray that this morning you would challenge and speak a word to each one of us, you would encourage us, and you would multiply your kingdom's work here in this place. God, we trust you and we look forward to what you wanna do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. you now to do the same thing for me do the same thing lord oh god my god i need you oh god my god i need you now how i need you now oh rock oh rock of ages i'm standing 
heard your children then you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same god you were providing then you Your presence 
There's always one more rung on the ladder. We climb and we get a step forward. We climb higher and then there's another place to go. No matter which ladder you're climbing, it seems like there's always more to do. There's lots of different ladders in life. And we're, we're taught this at an early, light, early stage in life. There's, there's a valedictorian in high school. There's a salutatorian in high school. There's the top half of the class. I have a friend who used to joke all the time that he made the top half of the class possible. So he was, he was really proud of that. Because if, if we don't have status, we'll make some up. We'll make up a status. I remember working at a coffee shop and we were all equals there, but there was a shift manager and I wasn't the shift manager. But I took pride in being the one, I actually make the coffee. I'm a barista. Sandwiches are for the other guys. Sandwiches are for the other people. I'm, an, I'm a coffee artist. We're making up status or we're striving for status so much of the time. And how's that working for you? <laughs> how, how is that going in your life? As a, as a 27 year old middle school pastor, I had the opportunity to sit down with someone who was in the chair that I wanted to be in, a mega church pastor. And I had the chance to interview him just for a few minutes. And I talked to him about ambition. And I was like, can you talk to me about your journey with ambition? You have 7,000 people listen to you every single week, live, in person. That's amazing. And he was like, I remember when I was in your stage and my goal was to be a lead pastor. And then I was a lead pastor. And then I looked around and other people had bigger churches than me. And I thought, if I could just get to 500 people. And then his church got to 500 people. And he looked around and said, if I could just get to 1,000 people. And then, of course, you know how it goes. If, then there was 2,000 people and 3,000 and so forth. And then he thought, if I could just be the president of a network of churches, then, then things will really be cooking. And then he gets there and he looks around and sees someone else who's a president or a, a national director of a network of churches that's even bigger and more influential than his. And that example stuck with me. Uh, because no matter what, there's one more thing. If you're looking at life and looking at whatever your ladder is through the lens of the world and how the world defines success, one of the things I appreciate about Solid Ground Church and our, our network, our family of churches, the Brethren in Christ, is that we strive in everything to keep Jesus at the center. And that's such a nice fluffy thing to say. And of course we should say that as a church, but we try to look at even the definition of success through the lens of Jesus, through Jesus' glasses. And how did Jesus view success? He's our example. And, and we try to follow Jesus radically here. We try to take Jesus literally from his teachings, but also, also his life example. And this time of year, we are, we are almost at the pinnacle of the church calendar. We're Palm Sunday. And this is a time in, in Jesus' life where he's just finished the Last Supper, where he took the position of a servant. He wasn't the host of the meal. Like, if you want to look at how Jesus defines success, he didn't just take the position of a servant. He, he, he took the position of the new guy. He grabbed a towel, the foot washing, scrubbing towel. And when his disciples were like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have a clue of who you are. You are the chosen one. We've been waiting for you for hundreds of years. There's prophecies about you. There's no way that the future liberator of Israel from the oppression of Rome, the one who's going to take us all the way, we're going to skip notches, baby. You're taking us to the top of the ladder. No way you're washing my feet. He's like, unless you let me wash your feet, you have no place in my kingdom. And then hours later, he's coming into Jerusalem. Everyone's understanding the symbolism. He's coming into Jerusalem like King Solomon on a donkey. People clue in, okay, this is it. He's the Messiah. He's the one. We're about to be in charge. We're about to go to the top of things. Here's the palm branches. We're laying them down. 
it's 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 really nice that he's coming in. That like that was a nice touch coming in on a donkey like King Solomon. Oh, see, look, our king and our Messiah is so humble, and we'll be humble too. We'll, we'll pride ourselves on our humility. We'll be we'll be the humblest worldwide dominant power on the planet. And as we we know how the story goes, that their expectations were dashed, and just in 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 a short amount of time, they went from shouting "Hosanna, save us now." to crucify him, because Jesus defined success differently. Jesus flipped everyone's expectations. And today, we're gonna talk about a passage in detail that talks about what Henry Nouwen coined this term, the downward ascent towards true success, towards the the path of Jesus isn't climbing up the ladder, It's, it's, it's going downward. So I wanna set up this passage. If you wanna turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter two, you can go ahead and turn there. But in this text, the ancient reader would have known the story of Alexander. Talk about climbing the ladder. He'd conquered the known world by his early 30s. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know which way was up or down by my early 30s. This guy was a military co- commander, started out as a prince, became king, now he's emperor conquered the world, and he got it in his head that he was a deity. This guy, I mean, where else do you go after emperor? I guess God is the only where, only other place you can go. That was a well-known story, and that was a well-known path of progression in the ancient world. Like, well, I guess once you're running things, I guess the only place to go is God. And in Paul's day, who, who he wrote this letter to the Philippians, the story of Augustus was well known, his rise up the ladder, becoming Caesar, becoming emperor, bringing relative peace to the entire known world. Not a bad accomplishment. He got it in his head, and other people got it in, in their heads that he was a deity. So you're going from human, to in charge, to accomplishing great things, to being a god. And this passage that we're about to read fits well as a contrast to that ancient narrative. It's almost like uh, God inspired Paul to say, oh, you think that's the way towards success? Oh, you think that's what God is like? Let me show you what God is like. This is one of the oldest hymns in the church, and it starts in the fifth verse of chapter two. This is, this is climbing. <laughs> in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus. So like I mentioned before, Jesus Christ is our example. He's, and he started at the top. This is God in human form. We celebrate at Christmas. The fancy term for it is the incarnation. Putting on flesh and blood and moving into the neighborhood is what God did. And once he started at that, at that position, which way did he go? He served. He didn't grasp for the top, oh, I'm a human now. I'm gonna use this to my advantage. He didn't grasp, he served. He told other people to serve. There's other places where Jesus is recording, uh, recorded as saying, oh, look, these disciples of mine, these followers of mine, they've got ambition. You wanna be the greatest in my kingdom? Awesome, I love that. But in my kingdom, the greatest serves the most. They don't grasp for power, for popularity, for influence, no. We we give power away. That's the way of my kingdom. We go down the ladder. So where did he go from this? He went down, and in verse six, Paul picks up and says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Like we said before, Christ started at the highest point and instead of going, I'm gonna go one more rung up. No, he became human and then became a servant to other humans. And humanity needed this. We see in the garden, all the way back in the Genesis narrative, humanity had wandered off. They had the opportunity to grasp from the tree of life and all the abundance God had given them or to choose from the knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to try to become 
like God. I said, no, this isn't good enough. I want to be God. We make that choice. I mean, the, that story happened, but that story still happens. And here's Jesus. What a contrast to that. Instead of saying, like I would, if I were God in human flesh, I would use every cheat code available to me, every advantage, every privilege. Ooh, that looks uncomfortable. Ooh, I'm going to use my deity to get around that. Jesus didn't. No. And in this passage, some have said that this, is, this was a decision where Jesus made the decision to stop being divine. No. He had all that comes along with that. This is God in human flesh. This decision to go down, and, and don't miss this, this decision to go down was made because he was divine. Humanity was and still is in a place where we need to know what God is like. God is the God who not just creates something and then when it gets into a mess and it's broken, fixes it. God is the God, who, Jesus is the God who, the only God who becomes that creation and then fixes it from the inside. So Christ's method of rescue, Christ's method of fixing in, fixing things, the method is that he became nothing, comparatively nothing, by stepping into our world and to serve and to save. And then in verse 8, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Doesn't get any further down the ladder than this. He died. He was killed, allowed himself to be killed by his own creation, by the violence and dysfunction and ambition that was existing in humanity. And even worse, it was the worst kind of death you could die. It was vulgar. The word crucified was not dinner table conversation. It was horrible. I've been thinking that when we look at the image of a cross, we have one in our sanctuary here at Solid Ground. What do we think about when we look at the cross? Is it a piece of jewelry? Is it a symbol to identify our, ourselves to other Christians? And I was thinking about this. This is what we should think about when we see a cross. We see the true meaning of who God is there. We serve the God, the one true God, and that God is self-giving love. The God that doesn't pick up a sword. God picks up a towel. God doesn't ride in on a chariot. Jesus rode into town on a donkey. And even better yet, he volunteered to do it. Jesus was going to this voluntarily, wasn't arm twisted into it. That's how much he loves humanity. That's how much Jesus loves you. Think about that. The creator of all of this created it, created you on purpose, and you mattered. And Jesus would have done all of this and gone to the cross even if it was only you. It's the God who leaves the 99 even for the one. You matter, my friend. Let that voice be the loudest in your head right now. Shut all the other voices. I should be this. I should be that. I'm not as high up the ladder as I should be. Jesus said, stop trying that way. My kingdom works differently. It's flipped upside down. So when you're following me, you're actually moving up in my kingdom. And that's what happens. Jesus was at the bottom. He's crucified. In the world's view of things, so many of his followers, they scattered. They were afraid. They thought everything was done. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every other name. When Jesus followed through with what he came for, God exalted him for it. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus did what only God can do. He said, I'm going to rescue you. We are separated by sin. You can't fix your problems. I'm going to come and become one of you and fix it for you. I'm going to redeem you and redeem all of this and start putting things back together again. It's so counterintuitive 
to the way our world works. You know, one of, one of the biggest influences on my theology is this guy named Henry Nouwen. He's up there with Dallas Willard and Tony Evans and, and just to, to name drop some of the heavyweights. But this guy has such an amazing story. He's the one that coined the downward ascent. Downward mobility is the term. Because this guy climbed the ladder as far as pastors could go. He happened to be a Jesus-loving Catholic priest. Came from the Netherlands. This guy was smart. Yeah, he was brilliant. It was quickly identified that he was a good teacher after seminary. He began teaching, working his way up the ladder, uh, teaching at Notre Dame and Harvard and Yale, big travel around the world speaking conference guy. But there was this gnawing like sense in his gut that this isn't what I was created for. And that's when he started doing things that people said, whoa, 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 Henry, what's going on here? You can, you can become more famous. You can preach to more people. You're, you're wanting to think about maybe being a missionary? So he moved to Brazil for a while and worked amongst the, the most underprivileged of underprivileged um, people groups that you can work with. And that was a wonderful thing, but he's thought, this still isn't it. And people are like, Henry, why are you there doing mission work? You should be in a classroom. You should be writing more books, selling more books. It's like, that's not what God has for me. And long story short, he wound up spending the last years of his life working with, with uh, developmentally challenged people with, with handicaps and all kinds of issues. And that's where he found his purpose in life. He spent the last years of his life working and ministering to people that couldn't read his books. And God transformed his heart in those communities. God transformed his ministry in those communities. And because he followed Jesus down the ladder and served people no one else wanted to serve, he became famous <laughs> for following Jesus. I love the irony in that. He wrote books about that, of course, too. But he didn't let that temptation to have people say nice things about him or to gain more popularity or to, to get more stuff. Uh, it, that didn't rule his life. He spent the last years of his life serving people that, that most in culture would say, oh, those people are way down the ladder from you. You're a brilliant professor. Like, no, this is what God created for me to do. And, and not every one of us can, can sell everything and go move into a community like that, but I love I love that impulse. I love that as an example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. God did amazing miracles in his life. Uh, and, and picking up with Paul's, the rest of his narrative in, in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This was all for God's glory. This is all God's heart. This God who will not share glory with anyone else, according to the Jewish story, shared glory with Jesus. This is what God has been up to the whole time. Jesus is God and is equal with God. But his, his progression from incarnation to death and resurrection, it isn't something that was required. And Jesus followed this path, didn't grasp to become equal with God like so many before him. It didn't require him to stop being God. His suffering and death was the perfect expression of the one true God. You want to know what God is like? Look at the cross. Look at Jesus' teachings and then look at his life. So for the ancient world... The Alexander story, Alexander the Great and Augustus, that fit in well with their thinking. They were used to that genre of lives and of storytelling, but it's hard for us to imagine how they would react to learning that the one true God was this crucified Jew from a backwater place in the Roman Empire. Wait, that doesn't fit the narrative. Bringing it to our day, many people in the world ask the same questions about Jesus. Did that really happen? Could that really be? 
And why, why would God do it like that? I'm wondering if in a sneaky way, we have adopted the pagan view of climbing the ladder in this world. You know, it, that's true. Like most of us are inundated every day with messages that tell us we need to climb the ladder of material possessions. Hey, we need to climb the ladder of accomplishments and accolades. We need to climb the ladder of popularity. Jesus didn't do any of that, and God exalted him. Maybe we've adopted the same pagan mindset. And if we have, don't you think it's about time for us to do what the writers of the New Testament and the writer of this passage urges us to do? Like, let's start with Jesus himself. And let's rethink our whole picture of God and this life around Jesus. And when we do that, I mean, the picture is challenging. It's not easy to serve other people. It's not easy to do what many other writers talk about is die to self. That's the Apostle Paul. It's not easy to do what Jesus said. Take up your cross and follow me. But when we start with Jesus and say, okay, this is God showing us what he's like. This, this God who is known most clearly through Jesus, when your heart and mind is moved by that thought and you become a disciple of Jesus, this command in the first verse that we read, it makes a lot more sense. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. So if we share in his humility, no, the promise here is that we'll share in his glory. When God looks at what we do, when we're in Christ, he doesn't look at our works. He sees what Jesus did. And this downward ascent, this following Jesus, downward mobility, it takes an extreme amount of effort. But when you're doing it out of a response to Jesus, it's like swimming with the current. It's like running with the wind at your back. And you're not striving so hard to do things on your own. Better yet, like when you're following Jesus, that, talk about a momentum builder. So that's our challenge this week. And I, I want us to continually be a community that looks at, at Scripture and thinks, how do we do this? What does it mean for them? What does it mean for us? And then how does, how does that change our lives? So this week, I want you to ask yourself in a moment of prayer, which ladder are you trying to climb? And the challenge is to stop striving to get up that ladder. Maybe for you, it looks like letting someone else have the last word. Maybe for you, it looks like serving someone else in secret, doing something nice and not getting any credit for it, or simplifying your life and not, not trying to, to gain status by, by possessions or, or, or maintaining your image. Or maybe it's as practical as taking the worst seat at the dinner table or the restaurant. Or I know this is painful, but I'm going to poke at you a little bit. But let someone else cut you off in line or in traffic. Whatever it is for you, I want to challenge you to do it purposefully and prayerfully and see what happens. Because in my experience, that's when God starts messing with your heart. Not doing something out of motivation or guilt or I guess I need to serve now because I watched Mike on YouTube and reminded me all these things that Jesus did. No, it's like, okay, if the prayer is, Jesus, I'm not seeing reality the way it really is when I do things the way the people around me and the world does things. God, I'm going to follow you and trust that there's going to be grace and strength. And as I follow you, you're going to infuse me with more hope and joy as, as my heart is reconfigured and the, the things I want out of this life is reconfigured. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's what we're celebrating here in this season of the church calendar. And I can't wait to see what happens. So please let us know in the comments in the next few weeks or reach out to us. Uh, send us an email at sgbic.com and, and we'll celebrate what God's doing in your life. And, and how God is moving in your relationships. So let me pray for you and then we'll dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, as we think about the cross today, we're reminded of how much you love us. Thank you. Thank you for your example 
Thank you for, for everything that you've gone through to make a way for us to experience your love and grace. And I pray for everybody here who is tired, and who's been striving and trying to climb up. And, and for those of us who've maybe fallen off the ladder a time or two, I pray that they will sense right now that they're not alone, that you are with them. And please give us your perspective uh, of, of which way is up and, and give us uh, even a desire to serve others. We pray this through the mighty and strong and healing name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So God bless you. I can't wait uh, to see you again. Make sure you invite somebody. Uh, send them the link so they can enjoy Easter service with us together and with you together. And uh, until we're together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and turn his face towards you. And may God give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.